Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Bless you. Today's the last day of 2023, New Year's Eve. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm fighting a little cold. We have a tendency to look back over the previous year and think about things. What went well, what didn't go so well, what we'd like to change. It normally prompts us to think of changes for 2024. We call them resolutions, New Year's resolutions. I want to lose some weight. I want to read more. I want to take up a hobby. I don't want to watch so much TV and those kind of things. Most of, most of those who make resolutions, though, aren't successful. Only about 9% of people who make resolutions actually complete the resolution. Only about nine, 1 in 10, approximately. Uh, by the end of the first week, 23% have given up. You can notice it, especially like there's a gym across the street. You drive by a gym, January, the parking lot is always packed. By February, it's not so much. They start to fall off, so to speak. And by, uh, by May, it's back to an empty parking lot. 46% give up by the end of January. And like I said, only 9% are successful in completing the resolutions. How many of you have watched the show Fixer Upper? I, I love that show. Lucy and I, I don't know if they do it anymore, but we watched most of the episodes of Fixer Upper. Uh, and actually, Lucy and I were down in Texas visiting her, her brothers in uh, Fort Worth, and she said to me, we got to go to Waco. I go, what's, what's in Waco? She goes, Chip and Joanna. <laughs> you know, they're in Waco. we got to go to Waco and go to, to uh, Magnolia Farms or Magnolia Market. We went to a breakfast, great restaurant, very expensive, but it was great. There's a lot of chemistry between Chip and Joanna. As you, if you've watched the show, you've no, you noticed that. Ch Joanna's kind of the, the artistic part, the design part, inside and out. And she, you know, she comes in the house, whichever, you know, as you, if you watch the show, they, they pick three houses and they have a couple, and they decide which house they want to remodel. And, and uh, Joanna always says, this wall's got to come down. We've got to open this up. We need an open floor pan. We're going to need to take this chimney out. And, and Chip's there, okay, I get, to I get to demo that wall. I get to demo that chimney because he loves demo day. He's, he's all in uh, de uh, demolition and the construct reconstruction. But he loves demo day, ripping out cabinets, tearing down walls, destroying old chimneys, that kind of thing. We're, again, breaking from our study in 2 Samuel, especially here with New Year's, to talk about, about our lives and what our, our goals are for 2024. I want us to think about where we are and what we, what we want to be. Growth as a, as a Christian, beloved, is not a passive situation. It's not a passive endeavor. You have to be intentional about Christian growth. You have to be intentional about following Christ. It's not just something that happens. We, you know, put the Bible under our pillow and we absorb the Bible while we sleep. Some, some act that way. But it's not. It's an intentional enterprise. Growth requires intentionality. And my question for you today is, are you a fixer-upper? If you're looking at me, you, you realize I am a fixer-upper. Are you a fixer-upper? If you have your Bible, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 1. Uh, I know the text said 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to get there eventually. We're going to look at two texts, and then we'll go to 2 Peter chapter 1. <coughs> Pardon me. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, we're going to be looking at. Because God has a process, beloved, for building our lives. And his building of our lives requires demolition. If you're going to experience the change, if you're a fixer-upper, God's going to have to do some demo. There's going to be a demo day in your life. It's not with Chip Gaines, but with the Holy Spirit. It's going to have to tear down some things. Notice what it says in verse 9. This is Jeremiah. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I put my words in your mouth. Verse 10. This is Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10. See, I've set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and overthrow, to then to build and to plant, to destroy and overthrow. Before construction can happen, you have to clear the lot. 
I was watching a, a big uh, machine was tearing down a house right here on Morgan Road. I'm not sure what they're going to do with the lot. But before you can do anything with that lot, you have to remove what's there. To, to, to build something new, you have to remove that structure that's there and demo it and get it off the property so that you can start fresh. And that's what God has to do sometimes. His process is to tear down all of those habits and those thoughts and those perspectives that are this worldly to give us something that's otherworldly. To, give a, to take something that's temporal and make it eternal. Like Chip Gaines, God needs to do some demo. Jeremiah was living in the time when Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar had already had uh, conquered, he'd beaten the Egyptians at the, at the, at the Battle of Carchemish in like 605 B.C., and then he was going to, he took over authority over all the land from Egypt all the way to Babylon, from Egypt to Babylon, and that, that included Jerusalem. And eventually, because the, uh, the, the Jews would, oh, would resist, rebel against him, he was going to destroy the temple. He was going to level the temple. It will be 70 years before Ezra and Nehemiah return to rebuild. But God said to Jeremiah, I'm going to destroy, I'm going to tear up, I'm going to overthrow, then I will build and plant. He was going to build and plant Ezra to build the temple, Nehemiah to construct the city walls, to reestablish the city of Jerusalem. But his process, beloved, many times involves beforehand removal of all those prejudices, ideas, thoughts, perspectives that are this worldly so that he can instill his thoughts and his plans. Remember what it says in the book of Isaiah. Going a little off script here. Isaiah chapter 55, your thoughts are not my thoughts, says the Lord. Your ways are not my ways. For as high as the heaven is above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And God needs to take our ways out so he can bring his ways in. That's the process. But let's look at the perspective. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, his perspective. God has a process, and he wants to give us a perspective. He wants to renew our perspective and how we not only view our own lives, but the, the world around us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, he says this, so we do not lose heart. Now, he's talking about all the tribulations he's going through in chapters 3 and 4. He talks about all the struggles they go through as the apostles. He says, but we don't lose heart. We're not giving up. We know God's in control. No matter what happens to us, God is in control. So we don't lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. As you get older, you young people will find this out, as you get older, things start to fall apart. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I was in the kitchen this morning. I made coffee, and I spilt uh, some of the old grounds on the floor, the kitchen floor, so I was, kinda, I was wiping them up, and I put them in the trash, and when I got up, I grunted. Ugh, something like that. It was hard to get up off the floor. And Lucy comes running in, what happened? I said, I was just getting up. <laughs> That's what happens now. The old man is wasting away. But the, new, the inner man is being renewed day by day. Paul says we don't lose heart because we realize the, the, this, this world is temporary. Uh, the outer man is falling apart. But the inner man is being renewed by his spirit. Verse 17, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not on the things, this is the perspective, beloved. As we look not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen, we tend to focus on the stuff that's seen. We tend to focus on what we can touch, what we can see, what we can hear. He says, for, uh, we look not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary or transient. It's hard for us to envision. I remember... Uh, the first time I read the text where Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And I thought to myself, this earth is pretty firm. 
Why is his words more permanent than this, this earth I'm standing on? And I've come to realize over my life as a Christian some 40 years, his words are permanent. The word of, the God, the word of God abides forever, the Bible says. And this world is temporary. This world's going to fail. This world is going to be burned up one day. And all that will remain is that which God has instilled. And so the things that we see that we think are so permanent are actually temporary. I remember when we moved into our house, I said, oh, this is our house. Our house, right? <laughs> the song, very, very fine house, right? It's just temporary. I'm actually, uh, we own the house, but not really. We rent it from the state of New York. Because if I don't pay taxes, they'll come and get it. Am I right? They'll come and take it from me, sell it for taxes. So I don't really own it. As a matter of fact, we don't really own anything. Job said, naked I came into the world, naked I shall return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so we, we tend to focus on the temporary. Paul wants to get us in a, a perspective because God has a process. He wants us to see this perspective. The things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. His eternal world. It's part of the demo. He, he breaks us down so that he can build us up. But then there's a progression. Now let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. There's a There's progression. He takes us from destruction to construction. There's a perspective, the temporal versus the eternal. Now let's look at the, the, the progression. In chapter 2, excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. First thing to think of, beloved, is God has given us what we need through the knowledge of Christ. He's given unto us all things that we need through the knowledge of Christ, which comes from his holy word. Then in verse 5, he talks about this progression, this process of growth and progression in the faith. He says in verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort. It's something intentional. Christian growth is intentional. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. We start with faith, and now he, he says he wants us to add obedience, virtue. That is where we begin to not only read his word, but live his word. Obedecer is the verb in Spanish, to, to obey, to obey Christ. We go from faith, and that faith now informs our life, and we begin to obey him. Add to virtue, knowledge. Knowledge, self-control. It's hard to have self-control at Christmas time, isn't it? <laughs> so many cookies and desserts. Self-control, steadfastness. Steadfastness, steadfastness, godliness. Godliness with brother affection, or the word is actually Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Well, we have the city of Philadelphia. We call it the city of brotherly love because it's two words. It's the Greek word phileo, which means to, to have affection, and Delphi, which is city, is the city of brotherly love. To have affection for our brothers and sisters, our natural family, but also our, our spiritual family. And a brotherly affection, agape, God's love. We progress from just uh, that love that for my fellow man and this affection I have for my brothers and sisters in Christ to this self-sacrificial love that, that I'm willing to give my life for other people to share what I have. Faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, self-control. And beloved, it's intentional. It's something you have to plan for. You plan this, this process that with this perspective, with this progression. It's a plan for us to become more like Christ. It's intentional. Every effort. And the foundation is faith that leads to love. And my question as I started this morning was, are you a fixer-upper? God has a building plan for you. Each person here this morning, God has a building plan for you. He, wants, he may need to do some demo. I know in my life, even though I've been a Christian for, mm, gosh, 45 years, 
There are still areas in my life where God may need to go in a room and, and totally demo the room. There's some old paneling on there. There's a drop ceiling that's sagging. That's right here, <laughs> the drop ceiling that's sagging. <laughs> he may need to do some demo to rebuild something that's eternal rather than temporal, something eternal. Let's think about some examples from the Bible. Remember Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 1, excuse me, Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 6. It tells us in this process that God had for Isaiah, Isaiah said, in the year of King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. He sees God in the heavens, and there were cherubim there. And they were saying, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is filled with your glory. Isaiah finally sees God with his eye. Now, I have a sense that Isaiah must have thought he was something because he was a prophet. Maybe he had some uh, ideas about who he was in God and his call, maybe a little arrogant, maybe a little uh, self-sufficient, because when he finally sees the Lord high and lifted up, what's he say? He doesn't say, hey, it's good for me to be here. I finally get to see that which I, I, I deserve to see God in all of his glory. What's he say? Woe is me. Woe is me. Because he can finally see God and beloved, when we see God, when we get a, an accurate picture of who God is and we can finally see him with the eyes of faith, we can begin to see ourselves and who we are and how far away we are from him. And that's why Isaiah says, woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm not that holy, he says. I'm a, I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips because I've seen the Lord of hosts. He gets a, an accurate picture of himself. Peter was called to be a disciple of Jesus. There must have been a lot of excitement in the land of, of Judea and Samaria and Galilee as Jesus' ministry began. He calls Peter, and Peter, you know, he's, he's an amazing uh, apostle of Jesus Christ, probably thought, he's picked me because I'm somebody special. Remember, in Luke chapter 5, they have the miracle of the draught. They, they get all these fish. Peter looks at Jesus. They've been fishing all night. And Jesus says, cast out your net on the other side. And Peter like, looks at him and goes, Master, we've been toiling all night. We've been here all night. I'm tired. I need breakfast. I want some coffee. We've been here all night. He says, nevertheless, at your word, I will do it. He throws the net on the other side, and there's this miracle draught of fish. So much so, the, the, the boat began to sink. There were so many fish. Or in the Italian, fishes. There were so many fishes. And Peter looks at Jesus. He gets on his knees. He says, depart from me, for I am... Does anybody know what he says? Sinful. I'm a sinful man. Oh, God, my translation says sinful. But unworthy is a good word. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O oh God. Peter could see Jesus and who he was, and then when you get an accurate picture of who Jesus is, the, the mirror he holds up to us gives us an accurate picture of who we are. God has to do some demolition in our lives. I think back to when I joined the Navy in 1978. I joined the Navy. First night in boot camp, I cried and thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? Chief Brandt was our company commander, our drill sergeant, they say in the Marines and the Army, my drill sergeant, we call him company commander, Chief Brandt. And Chief Brandt was a tough individual. And he started to break us down. You know, first morning he's yelling at us and calling us all kinds of names. And, you know, you, you're not worthy to be called a sailor yet. You're just a recruit. And he, start, he starts this, this process of breaking us down and then building us up. He taught us how to fold our underwear. He taught us how to fold our shirts and how to, how to make the bed, how to, make the, how to prepare the, the, the pillow and the blanket, and it had to all be a certain kind of way. Taught us how to write in the, in the log, how to remove a mistake. You don't erase it. You put a single line through it, initial. Date and initial. Single line, date and initial. And then started the process of teaching us about the different aspects of the, the rank in the, in the Navy, the different kind of jobs in the Navy. And it was about a 12-week process. Do you know, to this day, 
I still fold my shirts the same way that Chief Brandt taught me back in 1978. I fold a a t-shirt, you take the bottom, you fold it up to the shoulders, you fold in the the arms, then you fold it one more time, and then you, you, you fold it so it's like a little rectangle. Lucy folds them all different. I go, honey, that's wrong. That's not right. You can't do it that way. Why not? Because Chief Brandt said you can't do it that way. <laughs> I still have that in me. You break down to build up. God has this process. And he wants to give us a perspective, beloved, so that we see things with eyes of faith. What's your focus? If it's on what's seen, it's temporary. You're going to be disappointed. If you're focusing on the things that are seen, it's, you're going to be disappointed. Johnny Cash is one of my favorites. He does a song called Hurt, which was written by Nine Inch Nails. Never heard the original version. Matter of fact, if you Google uh, Hurt, you find Johnny Cash. And they actually say of that song, he made it his own. And in that song, Hurt, that Johnny Cash does before he passes away, he's, he's, he's at this table of you know, opulence and food and wealth, and he says, you can have it all. And he takes a goblet and he's just pouring wine on the table, just, you know, you can have it all. My empire of dirt. You can have it all. My empire of dirt. His perspective. They run after it in the entertainment world, only to be disappointed and become miserable because they've gotten what they thought would make them happy and they realize it disappoints. Going off script here a little bit, I think it was Jim Carrey, the the actor, comedian. He said something to the effect, I wish everybody could be rich so they could find out that it doesn't satisfy. I wish everybody could be rich so they would know it's not enough. Because we have a God-shaped hole in our heart. We need Christ to fill that hole, not the stuff. He's the one that fills the hole, and then the rest of all the other stuff in our life is gravy. Christ is the meat of the meal. Everything else is just gravy. When we put our focus on things unseen, on things eternal, we embrace the process to become more like Christ. That progression, that that intentional progression of adding to our faith virtue, to our virtue, knowledge, to our knowledge, self-control, to our self-control, steadfastness, and to our steadfastness, brotherly kindness, or love, and to our brotherly kindness, God's kind of love, agape. That progression, that intentional, and so maybe we're thinking this morning, okay, pastor, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do? I want you to commit to five things. First is I want the first thing I want you to commit to is to reading the Bible this next year. And it, hear me, if you can't read through the whole Bible, read through the New Testament. I think it's a chapter a day in the New Testament. You'll get through the New Testament in a year, and that's only five days a week, by the way. Just read through the Bible or read through the New Testament. Make a commitment, Pastor. I'm going to read through the Bible this year. Someone said to me before this morning, Pastor, do we have a message today about goals, about, you know, 2024? I, yeah, and, and this individual said to me, your encouragement last year did it for me, and I read the Bible every day. It meant so much to me to hear that. As a pastor, it breaks my heart that most Christians have never read through the Bible once. Let that not be said of us, beloved. Let's become men and women of the book. So our thoughts are, oh, that reminds me of a Bible story. You see something, oh, that reminds me of what happened to Joseph, or that reminds me of what happened to David, or that reminds me of what happened with Peter and Paul or whoever, fill in the blank. Jesus said this, beloved, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And the word continue there is in, in the original is a word that means to abide, to live, to dwell, to continue. Get God's word, beloved, into your soul. You can't get 
You can't get what you need on a weekly basis at church. Yes, you come and you can be fed here. You can be encouraged here. But one meal a week isn't sufficient. I don't normally fast. Well, let me take that back. I fast between meals. I don't know if you do that. I don't normally fast. Can you imagine, though, fasting for seven days and eating one meal a week? What would happen to you physically? You'd waste away. And, beloved, that's what's happening to us spiritually. We're not getting God's Word into our soul. We need a daily diet of His Word. Maybe a chapter, maybe a psalm, maybe a proverb. Get God's Word into your soul. It'll, it's transformational. I don't know how the Word of God does it. I just know it does. It's, it's like... You've heard me use this illustration before. Forgive me for being repetitive. I don't know how the microwave works to make microwave popcorn. I just know when I put that bag in there, when I hit three minutes, I, I hit three because I know at two it's done. And I'm listening for those last few pops. And I'll pull it out. And I got popcorn. I don't know the mechanism, but I know it works. And it's true with the Bible, beloved. I don't know the mechanism, but I know that it works. Commit to yourself to practicing what you're reading. When you read God's Word and it says, like in Ephesians chapter 4, don't steal, but work with your hands and give to those who have need, let's stop stealing. Obey. When it says, don't lie to your brother or your sister because they're, they we're of that same body there in Ephesians chapter 4, let's be truth tellers. Don't let any corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Let's Practice language that it lifts up rather than discourages and tears down and offends. Jesus said this in John 14, 21. Listen. Whoever has my commandments, and by the way, in your hands, you have his commandments. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he that loves me will be loved to my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So beloved, by taking God's word and putting it into practice, you evidence the fact that you love Jesus. You want to follow him. And he promises to it. Listen, he promises to manifest his presence and power in our life because we're not only reading his word, but we're practicing his word. We're putting it into practice. We're, we're obedient to Christ. So I want us to obey Christ. To make a commitment to obey Jesus. Also, beloved... I want us to make a commitment to pray every day. Pastor, I'm not really good at that whole prayer thing. I'm a little uncomfortable. Just, just pray the Lord's Prayer. Just pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, or put it in modern English, our Father who is in heaven, how holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Right? Or in Spanish, venga tu reino. Hágase tu voluntad. In la tierra, como en el cielo. You can say it in a different language if you want. To just say the Lord's Prayer in the morning and when you go to bed. Or pray the prayer of Jabez in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 4. Remember that book, The Prayer of Jabez? You prayed those two prayers in the morning. Watch what happens as you get comfortable talking to God. And it's just a conversation. Imagine Jesus is sitting in the, in the, in the passenger seat as you're driving to work. And talk to him. Lord, I've got a tough day ahead of me. Can you please help me, Lord? Now, you're not going to hear a voice in the passenger seat, hey, whatever you need. But maybe you'll hear it in your heart. That confidence, that faith, that Christ is listening to me. The old, in in uh, Psalm 66, I think it is, O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. You who hears prayer, he hears us when we pray. And as you get comfortable saying the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, you know what happens? You start to expand. Give us today our daily bread. Lord, today's payday. Help me to use the funds that you give me for your kingdom. Thank you for providing for my family. Thank you for this promotion, Lord. Give us this day our daily bread. Thanks for the promotion, Lord. You start to have conversation with them. Make a commitment to read God's Word, to obey God's Word, 
and also to pray on a daily basis. Also make a commitment. There's each person here this morning, think of one person in your life you want to see come to know Christ. Each person here this morning has a person in your life. Maybe it's someone at the grocery store. Maybe it's something on your job or a family member, a sibling, a, a parent, a child. Maybe it's a neighbor or a friend. Someone in your life you think, I would love to see that person come to Christ and start praying for that person on a daily basis. And it doesn't have to be an elegant, you know, prayer filled with language from the seminary. It can just be, Lord, I'm praying for my friend, Charlie. Help me show him Christ today. Who's your one? Who's that one person in your life you'd love to see come to know Christ? I have a bunch, to be honest with you. A bunch of people I, I, I think about all the time. Lord, help me share the gospel with that person. Help me, Lord, be kind to that person, to be generous to that person, to reflect the gospel to that person so that they would want to make a decision for Christ. Each person here has a, a person in your mind right now. That, so let's start praying for that person. Who is your one? And finally, the last commitment. Would you make a commitment to be joyful? Would you make a commitment to be joyful? What do you mean, Pastor? How tragic it is that there are a lot of Christians out there that people, they see them, they're a cold prickly than a warm fuzzy. People see this person who's a Christian and they're, they're depressed, they're angry, they're frustrated, they're, they're, they're cold, they're short, they don't have a kind word to say. I have a friend who's a server in a restaurant. They, they, they told me there was a table of 12 people. It was a Sunday afternoon, 1 o'clock, lunchtime. And this person was serving these 12 people. And they were, this is their words, they were miserable. 12 of the most miserable people this server had ever encountered. The, the coffee was cold. The, the drinks were, co weren't co were hot. The, the ice had melted. The salad was wilted. The soup was cold. The, the pasta wasn't good. You know, just one complaint after another. And, and serving 12 people, and when they left, they, they did not leave this person a tip. And as they're walking out of the restaurant, they went, oh, by the way, we'd like to invite you to our church. And my friend took it and said, thank you very much. Right in the trash. There was no joy. There was no kindness. There was no, there was no uh, um, um, generosity in the way they were living their lives. People around us need to see joy, amen? amen? They need to see generosity, kindness. I might have told you the story. I, I forget who I tell stories to. <laughs> That's us. <laughs> I was walking into Wegmans, sorry for Wegmans' illustration. I'm, no surprise, right? I'm walking into Wegmans, and there was this little old lady with her cart just standing there. And it was before Christmas, so I put my hand on her hand. I said, good morning, how are you? And she looked at me, and she smiled, and I said, I said, Merry Christmas. And she looked at me, Merry Christmas. And she was, just smiled. We just smiled at each other. I was just walking in. Joy. Kindness. Notice in somebody else. Generosity with words. You can be generous with words and emotions. You don't have to be just generous with cash. It's important in a restaurant when you tell your server you're a Christian, by the way, to be generous. But by the way, you can be generous with words and, and emotions and kindness. So I just put my hand on her hand and said, Merry Christmas. And I walked away. And so I'm, I'm, I'm in the the um, produce section, and I'm, you know, getting, I'm trying to get one of those, those bags open that's impossible. And this lady's looking at me with a smile on her face. I don't know if she's smiling because I can't get the bag open, or I said, do I know you? And she says, no, but you met my mother in the entryway. And it meant so much to me that you were kind to her. It made her day and it made my day. Beloved, let's be joyful. 
C.S. Lewis said, it's the job, it's the responsibility of every Christian to be as happy as they possibly can be. To reflect the goodness of God, amen? amen. Has God been good to you? Yes. He's been good to me. There's so much. I, I, I've had challenges. I don't think my, my, my knee will ever be the same after the surgery, after I got hurt down in South America. My knee's never going to be the same. But I'm thankful it works. God's been good to me. I've had challenges, you know, go down over my 63 years of life. Birthday's coming up, January 12th. I'm an extra large, by the way. <laughs> so, I don't want anything. <laughs> Just... <clears throat> sorry. I, I tell Lucy, honey, I can't turn it off. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> I've had challenges in my 63 years, but through it all, God has been good, and he will be good to us. Let's make a commitment today to read his word, to obey his word, to pray daily, to, to identify one person we want to see come to know Christ, and to make a commitment to be as happy as we possibly can be, to be joyful. God wants to fix us up. You may not be a fixer-upper. I know I'm a fixer-upper. God wants to work on us. Let's, let's allow him to do that by intentionally putting ourselves in the, in, the, in the way of grace. Let's stand together and close in prayer, shall we? Yeah. Let's pray together. Father, we, we want to be captivated like Isaiah. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with your glory. To be like Peter and recognize you're the Holy One, O Lord. Depart from us, for we're sinful. But yet you, you draw us close to you and you forgive us and cleanse us and restore us. We recognize, O Lord, you have a process to build us. Grant us a, a fresh perspective of who you are in the eternal rather than the temporary. And Lord Jesus, help us make progression in the faith through faith and virtue and knowledge and self-control and steadfastness and brotherly kindness and love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.